The German Ideology by Marx and Engels. The Leipzig Council. I. In the third volume of the Wigensk Weyertelgerse script for 1845 The Battle of the Huns, prophetically portrayed by Kalbach, 38 actually takes place. The spirits of the slain, whose fury is not appeased even in death, raise a hue and cry, which sounds like the thunder of battles and war cries, the clatter of swords, shields and iron wagons. But it is not a battle over earthly things. The holy war is being waged not over protective tariffs, the constitution, potato blight, 38 banking affairs and railways, but in the name of the most sacred interests of the spirit, in the name of substance, self-consciousness, criticism, the unique and the true man. We are attending a council of church fathers. As these church fathers are the last specimens of their kind, and as here, it is to be hoped, the cause of the Most High, alias the Absolute, is being pleaded for the last time, it is worthwhile taking a verbatim report of the proceedings. Here, first of all, is Saint Bruno, who is easily recognized by his stick, become sensuousness, become a stick, Wigand, p. 130. His head is crowned with a halo of pure criticism and, full of contempt for the world, he wraps himself in his self-consciousness. He has, smashed religion in its entirety and the state in its manifestations, p. 138, by violating the concept of substance in the name of the most high self-consciousness. The ruins of the church and debris of the state lie at his feet, while his glance strikes clown the masses into the dust. He is like God, he has neither father nor mother, he is his own creation, his own product, p. 136. In short, he is the Napoleon of the spirit, in spirit he is Napoleon. His spiritual exercises consist in constantly examining himself, and in this self-examination he finds the impulse to self-determination, p. 136, as a result of such wearisome self-recording he has obviously become emaciated. Besides examining himself from time to time he examines also, as we shall see, the Westphalist damp boot. Opposite him stands Saint Max, whose services to the Kingdom of God consist in asserting that he has established and proved on approximately 600 printed pages der Einzigunst sein Eigentum his identity, that he is not just anyone, not some Tom, Dick or Harry, but precisely Saint Max and no other. About his halo and other marks of distinction only one thing can be said, that they are his object and thereby his property, that they are unique and incomparable and that they are inexpressible, p. 148. See he is simultaneously the phrase and the owner of the phrase, simultaneously Sancho Panza and Don Quixote. His ascetic exercises consist of sour thoughts about thoughtlessness, of considerations throughout many pages about inconsiderateness and of the sanctification of unholiness. Incidentally, there is no need for us to elaborate on his virtues, for concerning all the qualities ascribed to him even if there were more of them than the names of God among the Muslims he is in the habit of saying, I am all this and something more, one am the all of this nothing and the nothing of this all. He is favorably distinguished from his gloomy rival in possessing a certain solemn light-heartedness and from time to time he interrupts his serious ponderings with a critical hurrah. These two grand masters of the Holy Inquisition summon the heretic Feuerbach, who has to defend himself against the grave charge of Gnosticism. The heretic Feuerbach, thunders Saint Bruno, is in possession of Heil, substance, and refuses to hand it over lest my infinite self-consciousness be reflected in it. Self-consciousness has to wander like a ghost until it has taken back into itself all things which arise from it and flow into it. It has already swallowed the whole world, except for this heil, substance, which the Gnostic Feuerbach keeps under lock and key and refuses to hand over. Saint Max accuses the Gnostic of doubting the dogma revealed by the mouth of Saint Max himself, the dogma that every goose, every dog, every horse is the perfect, or, if one prefers the superlative degree, the most perfect, man. Wigand, p. 187, the aforesaid does not lack a tittle of what makes man a man. Indeed, the same applies also to every goose, every dog, every, horse. 
Besides the hearing of these important indictments, sentence is also pronounced in the case brought by the two saints against Moses Hess and in the case brought by Saint Bruno against the authors of Die Heilige family. But as these accused have been busying themselves with worldly affairs and, therefore, have failed to appear before the Santa Casa, 40 they are sentenced in their absence to eternal banishment from the realm of the spirit for the term of their natural life. Finally, the two grand masters are again starting some strange intrigues among themselves and against each other. The German Ideology by Marx and Engels 2. Saint Bruno One campaign against fewer buck. Before turning to the solemn discussion which Bauer's self-consciousness has with itself and the world, we should reveal one secret. Saint Bruno uttered the battle cry and kindled the war only because he had to safeguard himself and his stale, soured criticism against the ungrateful forgetfulness of the public, only because he had to show that, in the changed conditions of 1845, criticism always remained itself and unchanged. He wrote the second volume of The Good Cause and His Own Cause Bruno Bauer's article Characteristic Ludwig Feuerbach's is here ironically called the second volume of Bauer's book Die Gutsach der Freiheit und mein Eigen Angela Genheit The Good Cause of Freedom and My Own Cause, he stands his ground, he fights pro eris et foci's. Literally, for altars and hearths, used in the sense of, for house and home that is, pleading his own cause in the true theological manner, however, he conceals this aim of his by an appearance of wishing to characterize fewer buck. Poor Bruno was quite forgotten, as was best proved by the polemic between fewer buck and Stirner, fewer buck, Über das Wesen de Krenthums in Besichung auf den Einzigen und Sen Eigentum which no notice at all was taken of him. For just this reason he seized on this polemic in order to be able to proclaim himself, as the antithesis of the antagonists, their higher unity, the Holy Spirit. Saint Bruno opens his campaign with a burst of artillery fire against Feuerbach, that is to say, with a revised and enlarged reprint of an article which had already appeared in the Norddeutsche Blatter. Bruno Bauer's article Ludwig Feuerbach Feuerbach is made into a night of substance in order that Bauer's self-consciousness shall stand out in stronger relief. In this transubstantiation of Feuerbach, which is supposed to be proved by all the writings of the latter, our holy man jumps at once from Feuerbach's writings on Leibniz and Bell the reference is to the following works of Feuerbach, Geschick der Nuren Philosophie. Darstellian, Entwerklung und Kritik der Leibnizischen Philosophie and Pierre Bell to the Wesen de Christentmus, leaving out the article against the positive philosophers, 41 in the Hallisk Jahrbücher. Ludwig Feuerbach, Zur Kritik der Positiven Philosophie This oversight is in place. For there Feuerbach revealed the whole wisdom of self-consciousness as against the positive representatives of substance, at a time when Saint Bruno was still indulging in speculation on the Immaculate Conception. It is hardly necessary to mention that Saint Bruno still continues to prance about on his old Hegelian war horse. Listen to the first passage in his latest revelations from the Kingdom of God. Hegel combined into one Spinoza's substance and Fichte's ego, the unity of both, the combination of these opposing spheres, etc., constitutes the peculiar interest but, at the same time, the weakness of Hegel's philosophy. This contradiction in which Hegel's system was entangled had to be resolved and destroyed. But he could only do this by making it impossible for all time to put the question, what is the relation of self-consciousness to the absolute spirit? This was possible in two ways. Either self-consciousness had to be burned again in the flames of substance, i.e., the pure substantiality relation had to be firmly established and maintained, or it had to be shown that personality is the creator of its own attributes and essence, that it belongs to the concept of personality in general to posit itself, the concept or the personality. As limited, and again to abolish this limitation which it posits by its universal essence, for precisely this essence is only the result of its inner self-distinction of its activity, Wigand, pages 86, 87, 88. Bruno Bauer, Characteristic Ludwig Fewer Bucks. In Die Heilige Family, p. 220, Hegelian philosophy was represented as a union of Spinoza and Fichte and at the same time the contradiction involved in this was emphasized. 
The specific peculiarity of Saint Bruno is that, unlike the authors of Die Heilige family, he does not regard the question of the relation of self-consciousness to substance as a point of controversy within Hegelian speculation, but as a world-historic, even an absolute question. This is the sole form in which he is capable of expressing the conflicts of the present day. He really believes that the triumph of self-consciousness over substance has a most essential influence not only on European equilibrium but also on the whole future development of the Oregon problem. As to the extent to which the abolition of the Corn Laws in England depends on it, very little has so far transpired. 42. The abstract and nebulous expression into which a real collision is distorted by Hegel is held by this critical mind to be the real collision itself. Bruno accepts the speculative contradiction and upholds one part of it against the other. A philosophical phrase about a real question is for him the real question itself. Consequently, on the one hand, instead of real people and their real consciousness of their social relations, which apparently confront them as something independent, he has the mere abstract expression, self-consciousness, just as, instead of real production, he has the activity of the self-consciousness, which has become independent. On the other hand, instead of real nature and the actually existing social relations, he has the philosophical summing up of all the philosophical categories or names of these relations in the expression, substance, for Bruno, along with all philosophers and ideologists, erroneously regards thoughts and ideas the independent intellectual expression of the existing world as the basis of this existing world. It is obvious that with these two abstractions, which have become senseless and empty, he can perform all kinds of tricks without knowing anything at all about real people and their relations. See, in addition, what is said about substance in connection with Feuerbach and concerning humane liberalism and the holy in connection with St. Max. Hence, he does not forsake the speculative basis in order to solve the contradictions of speculation, he maneuvers while remaining on that basis, and he himself still stands so much on the specifically Hegelian basis that the relation of self-consciousness to the absolute spirit still gives him no peace. In short, we are confronted with the philosophy of self-consciousness that was announced in the Der Synoptiker, carried out in Das Entent Christentum and which, unfortunately, was long ago anticipated in Hegel's phenomenology. This new philosophy of Bowers was completely disposed of in Die Heilige family on page 220 et sequel and on pages 304, 07. Here, however, Saint Bruno even contrives to caricature himself by smuggling in personality, in order to be able, with Stirner, to portray the single individual as his own product, and Stirner as Bruno's product. This step forward deserves a brief notice. First of all, let the reader compare this caricature with the original, the explanation given of self-consciousness in Das Entdeckt Christentum, page 113, and then let him compare this explanation with its prototype, with Hegel's Phenomenology, pages 575, 583 and so on. Both these passages are reproduced in Die Heilige Family, pages 221, 223, 224. But now let us turn to the caricature. Personality in general. Concept. Universal essence. To posit itself as limited and again to abolish the limitation. Inner self-distinction. What tremendous results. Personality in general is either nonsense in general or the abstract concept of personality. Therefore, it is part of the concept of the concept of personality to posit itself as limited. This limitation, which belongs to the concept of its concept, personality directly afterwards posits by its universal essence. And after it has again abolished this limitation, it turns out that precisely this essence is the result of its inner self-distinction. The entire grandiose result of this intricate tautology amounts, therefore, to Hegel's familiar trick of the self-distinction of man in thought, a self-distinction which the unfortunate Bruno stubbornly proclaims to be the sole activity of personality in general. A fairly long time ago it was pointed out to Saint Bruno that there is nothing to be got from a personality whose activity is restricted to these, by now trivial, logical leaps. 
At the same time the passage quoted contains the naive admission that the essence of Bauer's personality is the concept of a concept, the abstraction of an abstraction. Bruno's criticism of Feuerbach, insofar as it is new, is restricted to hypocritically representing Stirner's reproaches against Feuerbach and Bauer as Bauer's reproaches against Feuerbach. Thus, for example, the assertions that the essence of man is essence in general and something holy, that man is the god of man, that the human species is the absolute, that Feuerbach splits man into an essential and an inessential ego, although Bruno always declares that the abstract is the essential and, in his antithesis of criticism and the mass, conceives the split as far more monstrous than Feuerbach does, that a struggle must be waged against the predicates of God, etc. On the question of selfish and selfless love, Bruno, polemising with Feuerbach, copies Stirner almost word for word for three pages, pages 133 to 35, just as he very clumsily copies Stirner's phrases, every man is his own creation, truth is a ghost, and so on. In addition, in Bruno the creation is transformed into a product. We shall return to this exploitation of Stirner by Saint Bruno. Thus, the first thing that we discovered in Saint Bruno was his continual dependence on Hegel. We shall not, of course, dwell further on the remarks he has copied from Hegel, but shall only put together a few more passages which show how firmly he believes in the power of the philosophers and how he shares their illusion that a modified consciousness, a new turn given to the interpretation of existing relations, could overturn the whole hitherto existing world. Imbued with this faith, Saint Bruno also has one of his pupils certify in issue 4 of Wiggins Quarterly, p. 327 that his phrases on personality given above, which were proclaimed by him in issue 3, were world-shattering ideas. Über das Recht der Frage sprechen an. Saint Bruno says, Wigand, p. 95, Bruno Bauer, Charakteristic Ludwig Feuerbachs. Philosophy has never been anything but theology reduced to its most general form and given its most rational expression. This passage, aimed against Feuerbach, is copied almost word for word from Futterbach's Philosophie der Zuckenfeed, p2. Speculative philosophy is true, consistent, rational theology. Bruno continues. Philosophy, in alliance with religion, has always striven for the absolute dependence of the individual and has actually achieved this by demanding and causing the absorption of the individual life in universal life, of the accident in substance, of man in the absolute spirit. As if Bruno's philosophy, in alliance with Hegel's, and his still continuing forbidden association with theology, did not demand, if not cause, the absorption of man in the idea of one of his accidents, that of self-consciousness, as substance. Moreover, one sees from this whole passage with what joy the Church Father with his pulpit eloquence continues to proclaim his world-shattering faith in the mysterious power of the holy theologians and philosophers. Of course, in the interests of the good cause of freedom and his own cause. Ironical allusion to Bauer's book Die Gutsach der Freiheit und mein Eigen Angela Genheit. On page 105 our God-fearing man has the insolence to reproach Feuerbach. Feuerbach made of the individual, of the depersonalist man of Christianity, not a man, not a true, real, personal, man, these predicates owe their origin to Die Heilige family and Stirner, but an emasculated man, a slave. And thereby utters, in Teralia, the nonsense that he, Saint Bruno, can make people by means of the mind. Further on in the same passage he says, According to Feuerbach the individual has to subordinate himself to the species, serve it. The species of which Feuerbach speaks is Hegel's absolute, and it, too, exists nowhere. Here, as in all the other passages, Saint Bruno does not deprive himself of the glory of making the actual relations of individuals dependent on the philosophical interpretation of these relations. He has not the slightest inkling of the correlation which exists between the concepts of Hegel's absolute spirit and Futterbach's species on the one hand and the existing world on the other. On page 104 the Holy Father is mightily shocked by the heresy with which Feuerbach transforms the Holy Trinity of Reason, 
love and will into something that is in individuals and over individuals, as though, in our day, every inclination, every impulse, every need did not assert itself as a force in the individual and over the individual, whenever circumstances hinder their satisfaction. If the Holy Father Bruno experiences hunger, for example, without the means of appeasing it, then even his stomach will become a force in him and over him. Futterbach's mistake is not that he stated this fact but that in idealistic fashion he endowed it with independence instead of regarding it as the product of a definite and surmountable stage of historical development. Page 111, Feuerbach is a slave and his servile nature does not allow him to fulfill the work of a man, to recognize the essence of religion, what a fine work of a man. He does not perceive the essence of religion because he does not know the bridge over which he can make his way to the source of religion. Saint Bruno still seriously believes that religion has its own essence. As for the bridge, over which one makes one's way to the source of religion, this ass's bridge upon in the original, S. Ellsbruck ass's bridge an expedient used by dull or lazy people to understand a difficult problem must certainly be an aqueduct. At the same time Saint Bruno establishes himself as a curiously modernized Karen who has been retired owing to the building of the bridge, becoming a toll keeper who demands a halfpenny from every person crossing the bridge to the spectral realm of religion. On page 120 the saint remarks. How could Feuerbach exist if there were no truth and truth were only a specter, sterner, help? Of which hitherto man has been afraid. The man who fears the specter of truth is no other than the worthy Bruno himself. Ten pages earlier, on P110, he had already let out the following world-shattering cry of terror at the sight of the specter of truth. Truth which is never of itself encountered as a ready-made object and which develops itself and reaches unity only in the unfolding of personality. Thus, we have here not only truth, this specter, transformed into a person which develops itself and reaches unity, but in addition this trick is accomplished in a third personality outside it, after the manner of the tapeworm. Concerning the holy man's former love affair with truth, when he was still young and the lusts of the flesh still strong in him see die Heilige family, p. 115 et sec. How purified of all fleshly lusts and earthly desires our holy man now appears is shown by his vehement polemic against Fugerbach's sensuousness. Bruno by no means attacks the highly restricted way in which Feuerbach recognizes sensuousness. He regards Fugerbach's unsuccessful attempt, since it is an attempt to escape ideology, as a sin. Of course. Sensuousness is lust of the eye lust of the flesh and arrogance cf 1 john 2 16 horror and abomination cf ezekiel 11 18 in the eyes of the lord do you not know that to be fleshly minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace for to be fleshly minded is hostility to criticism and everything of the flesh is of this world and do you not know that it is written the works of the flesh are manifest they are adultery fornication uncleanness obscenity, idolatry, witchcraft, enmity, strife, envy, anger, quarrelsomeness, discord, sinful gangs, hatred, murder, drunkenness, gluttony and the like. Cf Galatians 5, 19, 21 I prophesy to you, as I prophesied before, that those who do such works will not inherit the kingdom of criticism, but woe to them for in their thirst for delights they are following the path of Cain and are falling into the error of Balaam, and will perish in a rebellion, like that of Korah. These lewd ones feast shamelessly on your alms, and fatten themselves. They are clouds without water driven by the wind, bare, barren trees, twice dead and uprooted, wild ocean waves frothing their own shame, errant stars condemned to the gloom of darkness forever. CF Jude 11 to 13 for we have read that in the last days there will be terrible times, people will appear who think much of themselves, lewd vilifiers who love voluptuousness CF 2 Timothy 3, 1, for more than criticism, makers of sinful gangs, in short, slaves of the flesh. Such people are shunned by Saint Bruno, who is spiritually minded and loathes the stained covering of the flesh CF Jude 23 and for this reason he condemns Feuerbach whom he regards as the Korah of the gang, to remain outside together with the dogs, the magicians, 
the debauched and the assassins. CF Revelation 22 15 Sensuousness UG. Not only does it throw the saintly church father into the most violent convulsions, but it even makes him sing, and on page 121 he chants the song of the end and the end of the song. Sensuousness do you know, unfortunate one, what sensuousness is? Sensuousness is a stick, p 130. Seized with convulsions, Saint Bruno even wrestles on one occasion with one of his own theses, just as Jacob of blessed memory wrestled with God, with the one difference that God twisted Jacob's thigh, while our saintly epileptic twists all the limbs and ties of his own thesis, and so, by a number of striking examples, makes clear the identity of subject and object. Feuerbach may say what he likes, all the same he destroys. Man, for he transforms the word man into a mere phrase, for he does not wholly make and create. Man, but raises the whole of mankind to the absolute, for in addition he declares not mankind, but rather the senses to be the organ of the absolute, and stamps the sensuous the object of the senses, of perception, of sensation as the absolute, the indubitable and the immediately certain. Whereby fewer box such as Saint Bruno's opinion can undoubtedly shake layers of the air, but he cannot smash the phenomena of human essence, because his innermost essence and his vitalising spirit, already destroys the external sound and makes it empty and jarring, p 121. Saint Bruno himself gives us mysterious but decisive disclosures about the causes of his nonsensical attitude. As though my ego does not also possess just this particular sex, unique, compared with all others, and these particular, unique sex organs, besides his unique sex organs, this noble-minded man also possesses a special unique sex. This unique sex is explained on page 121 in the sense that sensuousness, like a vampire, sucks all the marrow and blood from the life of man, it is the insurmountable barrier against which man has to deal himself a mortal blow. But even the saintliest man is not pure. They are all sinners and lack the glory that they should have before self-consciousness. Saint Bruno who in his lonely cell at midnight struggles with substance, has his attention drawn by the frivolous writings of the heretic Feuerbach to women and female beauty. Suddenly his sight becomes less keen, his pure self-consciousness is besmirched, and a reprehensible, sensuous fantasy plays about the frightened critic with lascivious images. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. C.F. Matthew 26, 41 Bruno stumbles, he falls, he forgets that he is the power that with its strength binds, frees and dominates the world, cf Ibid 1619 he forgets that these products of his imagination are spirit of his spirit, he loses all self-control and, intoxicated, stammers a dithyram to female beauty, to its tenderness, softness, womanliness, to the full and rounded limbs and the surging, undulating, seething, rushing and hissing, wave-like structure of the body of, woman. Innocence, however, always reveals itself even where it sins. Who does not know that a surging, undulating, wave-like structure of the body is something that no eye has ever seen, or ear heard? Therefore hush, sweet soul, the spirit will soon prevail over the rebellious flesh and set an insurmountable barrier to the overflowing, seething lusts, against which they will soon deal themselves a mortal blow. Feuerbach the saint finally arrives at this through a critical understanding of Die Heilige family is a materialist tempered with and corrupted by humanism, i.e., a materialist who is unable to endure the earth and its being, Saint Bruno knows the being of the earth as distinct from the earth itself, and knows how one should behave in order to endure the being of the earth. But wants to spiritualism himself and rise into heaven, and at the same time he is a humanist who cannot think and build a spiritual world, but one who is impregnated with materialism, and so on, p. 123. Just as for Saint Bruno humanism, according to this, consists in thinking and in building a spiritual world, so materialism consists in the following. The materialist recognizes only the existing, actual being, matter, as though man with all his attributes, including thought, were not an existing, actual being, 
and recognizes it as actively extending and realizing itself in multiplicity, nature, p. 123. First, matter is an existing, actual being, but only in itself, concealed, only when it actively extends and realizes itself in multiplicity, an existing, actual being realizes itself. Only then does it become nature. First there exists the concept of matter, an abstraction, an idea, and this latter realizes itself in actual nature. Word for word the Hegelian theory of the pre-existence of the creative categories. From this point of view it is understandable that Saint Bruno mistakes the philosophical phrases of the materialists concerning matter for the actual kernel and content of their world outlook. To Saint Bruno's views on the struggle between Feuerbach and Stirner. Having thus admonished Feuerbach with a few weighty words, Saint Bruno takes a look at the struggle between Feuerbach and the unique. The first evidence of his interest in this struggle is a methodical, triple smile. The critic pursues his path irresistibly, confident of victory, and victorious. He is slandered, he smiles. He is called a heretic, he smiles. The old world starts a crusade against him, he smiles. Saint Bruno this is thus established pursues his path but he does not pursue it like other people, he follows a critical course, he accomplishes this important action with a smile. He does smile his face into more lines than are in the new map, with the augmentation of the Indies. One know my lady will strike him, if she do, he'll smile and take it for a great art, Shakespeare, Twelfth Night, Act 3, Scene 2. Marx and Engels quote these lines front the German translation by August Wilhelm von Schlegel. But they have substituted the word Kunst, art, for the word Gunst, favor, like Shakespeare's Malvolio. Saint Bruno himself does not lift a finger to refute his two opponents, he knows a better way of ridding himself of them, he leaves them divide et imperid to their own quarrel. He confronts Stirner with Fugerbach's man, p. 124, and Feuerbach with Stirner's unique, p. 126 et sequel, he knows that they are as incensed against each other as the two Kilkenny cats in Ireland, which so completely devoured each other that finally only their tails remained. 43 And Saint Bruno passes sentence on these tales, declaring that they are substance and, consequently, condemned to eternal damnation. In confronting Feuerbach with Stirner he repeats what Hegel said of Spinoza and Fichte, where, as we know, the punctiform ego is represented as one, and moreover the most stable, aspect of substance. However much Bruno formerly raged against egoism, which he even considered the odor specificus of the masses, on page 129 he accepts egoism from Stirner only this should be not that of Max Stirner, but, of course, that of Bruno Bauer. He brands Stirner's egoism as having the moral defect that his ego for the support of its egoism requires hypocrisy, deception, external violence. For the rest, B believes, CP 124, in the critical miracles of Saint Max and sees in the latter's struggle, p. 126, a real effort to radically destroy substance. Instead of dealing with Stirner's criticism of Bauer's pure criticism, he asserts on p. 124 that Stirner's criticism could affect him just as little as any other, because he himself is the critic. Finally Saint Bruno refutes both of Theon, Saint Max and Feuerbach, applying almost literally to Feuerbach and Stirner the antithesis drawn by Stirner between the critic Bruno Bauer and the dogmatist. Wigand, p. 138, Feuerbach puts himself in opposition to, and thereby stands in opposition to, the unique. He is a communist and wants to be one. The unique is an egoist and has to he one, he is the holy one, the other the profane one, he is the good one, the other the evil one, he is God, the other is man. Both are dogmatists. The point is, therefore, that he accuses both of dogmatism. Der Einzigunst sein Eigentum, p. 194, the critic is afraid of becoming dogmatic or of putting forward dogmas. Obviously, he would then become the opposite of a critic, a dogmatist, he who as a critic was good, would now become evil, or from being unselfish, a communist, 
would become an egoist, etc. Not a single dogma. That is his dogma. 3. Saint Bruno vs. The Authors of Die Heilige Family Saint Bruno, who has disposed of Feuerbach and Stirner in the manner indicated and who has cut the unique off from all progress, now turns against the apparent consequences of Feuerbach, the German communists and, especially, the authors of Die Heilige Family. The expression Real Humanism, which he found in the preface to this polemic treatise, provides the main basis of his hypothesis. He will recall a passage from the Bible. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, in our case it was just the opposite, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. 1 Corinthians, 3, 1 2. The first impression that Die Heilige family made on the worthy church father was one of profound distress and serious, respectable sorrow. The one good side of the book is that it showed what Feuerbach had to become, and the position his philosophy can adopt, if it desires to fight against criticism, p. 138. That, consequently, it combined in an easy-going way desiring with what can be and what must he, but this good side does not outweigh its many distressing sides. Feuerbach's philosophy, which strangely enough is presupposed here, dare not and cannot understand the critic, dare not and cannot know and perceive criticism in its development, dare not and cannot know that, in relation to all that is transcendental, criticism is a constant struggle and victory, a continual destruction and creation, the soul. Creative and productive principle. It dare not and cannot know how the critic has worked, and still works, to posit and to make. The transcendental forces, which up to now have suppressed mankind and not allowed it to breathe and live, into what they really are, the spirit of the spirit, the innermost of the innermost, a native thing. Out of and in the native soil, products and creations of self-consciousness. It dare not and cannot know that the critic and only the critic has smashed religion in its entirety, and the state in its various manifestations, etc. Pages 138,139 is this not an exact copy of the ancient Jehovah, who runs after his errant people who found greater delight in the cheerful pagan gods, and cries out, Hear me, Israel, and close not your ear, Judah. Am I not the Lord your God, who led you out of the land of Egypt into the land flowing with milk and honey, and behold, from your earliest youth you have done evil in my sight and angered me with the work of my hands and turned your back unto me and not your face towards me, though one invariably tutored you, and you have brought abominations into my house to defile it, and built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Himon, which one did not command, and it never entered my head that you should do such abominations, and one have sent to you my servant Jeremiah, to whom I did address my word, beginning with the thirteenth year of the reign of King Josiah, son of Ammon, unto this day and for twenty-three years now he has been zealously preaching to you, but ye have not hearkened. Therefore says the Lord God, who has ever heard the like of the Virgin of Israel doing such an abomination. For rain water does not disappear so quickly as my people forgets me. Zero earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Cf Jeremiah 2, 6, 32, 22, 30, 33 to 35, 25, 3, 19, 3, 1813, 14, 22, 29. Thus, in a lengthy speech on to dare and to be able, Saint Bruno asserts that his communist opponents have misunderstood him. The way in which he describes criticism in this recent speech, the way in which he transforms the former forces that suppressed, the life of mankind into transcendental forces, and these transcendental forces into the spirit of the spirit, and the way in which he presents criticism as the sole branch of production proves that the apparent misconception is nothing but a disagreeable conception. We prove that Bauer's criticism is beneath all criticism, owing to which we have inevitably become dogmatists. He even in all seriousness reproaches us for our insolent disbelief in his ancient phrases. The whole mythology of independent concepts, 
with Zeus the Thunderer's self-consciousness at the head, is paraded here once again to the jingling of hackneyed phrases of a whole Janissari band of current categories. Literature Tsaidu, CF Di Hilage Family, P234. First of all, of course, the myth of the creation of the world, i.e., of the hard won abour of the critic, which is the sole creative and productive principle, a constant struggle and victory, a continual destruction and creation, working and having worked. Indeed, the Reverend Father even reproaches Die Heilage family for understanding criticism in the same way as he understands it himself in the present rejoinder. After taking back substance into the land of its birth, self-consciousness, the criticizing and, since Die Heilage family also, the criticized man, and discarding it, self-consciousness here seems to take the place of an ideological lumber room, he continues. It, the alleged philosophy of Feuerbach, dare not know that criticism and the critics, as long as they have existed, have guided and made history, that even their opponents and all the movements and agitations of the present time are their creation, that it is they alone who hold power in their hands, because strength is in their consciousness, and because they derive power from themselves, from their deeds, from criticism, from their opponents, from their creations, that only by the act of criticism is man freed, and thereby man also, and man is created, and thereby mankind as well. Thus, criticism and the critics are first of all two wholly different subjects, existing and operating apart from each other. The critic is a subject different from criticism, and criticism is a subject different from the critic. This personified criticism, criticism as a subject, is precisely that critical criticism against which Die Heilage family was directed. Criticism and the critics, as long as they have existed, have guided and made history. It is clear that they could not do so as long as they did not exist, and it is equally clear that as long as they have existed they made history in their own fashion. Finally, Saint Bruno goes so far as to dare and be able to give us one of the most profound explanations about the state-shattering power of criticism, namely, that criticism and the critics hold power in their hands, because, a fine because. Strength is in their consciousness, and, secondly, that these great manufacturers of history hold power in their hands, because they derive power from themselves and from criticism, i.e., again from themselves, whereby it is still, unfortunately, not proven that it is possible to derive anything at all from there, from themselves, from criticism. On the basis of criticism's own words, one should at least believe that it must be difficult to derive from there anything more than the category of substance discarded there. Finally, criticism also derives from criticism power for a highly monstrous oracular dictum. For it reveals to us a secret that was hidden cf Colossians 1, 26 from our fathers and unknown to our grandfathers, the secret that only by the act of criticism is man created, and thereby mankind as well whereas, up to now, criticism was erroneously regarded as an act of people who existed prior to it owing to quite different acts. Hence it seems that Saint Bruno himself came into the world, from the world, and to the world through criticism, i.e., by gene ratio equiacus spontaneous generation. All this is, perhaps, merely another interpretation of the following passage from the book of Genesis, and Adam knew, i.e., criticized, Eve his wife, and she conceived, cf Genesis 4, 1 etc. Thus we see here the whole familiar critical criticism, which was already sufficiently characterized in Die Heilage family, confronting us again with all its trickery as though nothing had happened. There is no need to be surprised at this, for the saint himself complains, on page 140, that Die Heilage family cuts criticism off from all progress. With the greatest indignation Saint Bruno reproaches the authors of Die Heilage family because, by means of a chemical process, they evaporated Bauer's criticism from its fluid state into a crystalline state. It follows that institutions of mendicancy, the baptismal certificate of adulthood, the regions of pathos and thunder-like aspects, the Musulman conceptual affliction, Die Heilage family, pages 2, 3, 
for according to the critical literature Zeitung, all this is nonsense only if it is understood in the crystalline manner. And the 28 historical howlers of which criticism was proved guilty in its excursion on English Tages Frage an article by Julius Faucher are they not errors when looked at from the fluid point of view? Does criticism insist that, from the fluid point of view, it prophesied a priori the Nawark conflict 44 long after this had taken place before its eyes and did not construct it post festum? Does it still insist that the word miracle could mean farrier from the crystalline point of view, but from the fluid point of view at any rate must mean martial? Or that although in the crystalline conception unfate physique may mean a physical fact, the true fluid translation should be a fact of physics? Or that la malvalence dnos bourgeois just milieu the ill will of our middle of the road bourgeois in the fluid state still means the carefreeness of our good burgers? Does it insist that, from the fluid point of view, a child that does not, in its turn, become a father or mother is essentially a daughter. That someone can have the task of representing, as it were, the last tear of grief shed by the past. That the various concierges, lions, grisettes, marquises, scoundrels and wooden doors in Paris in their fluid form are nothing but phases of the mystery in whose concept in general it belongs to posit itself as limited and again to abolish this limitation which is posted by its universal essence, for precisely this essence is only the result of its inner self-distinction, its activity Bruno Bauer, characteristic Ludwig Feuerbach's. That critical criticism in the fluid sense pursues its path irresistibly, victorious and confident of victory, when in dealing with a question it first asserts that it has revealed its true and general significance and then admits that it had neither the will nor the right to go beyond criticism, and finally admits that it had still to take one step but that step was impossible because it was impossible, die Heilage family, p. 184. That from the fluid point of view the future is still the work of criticism, although fate may decide as it will be Bauer, newest schrift and Uber die Judenfridge. That from the fluid point of view criticism achieved nothing superhuman when it came into contradiction with its true elements a contradiction which had already found its solution in these same elements B. Bauer, was ist jetzt der Gegenstand der Kritik? The authors of Die Heilige Family have indeed committed the frivolity of conceiving these and hundreds of other statements as statements expressing firm, crystalline nonsense but the synoptic gospels should be read in a fluid way, i.e., according to the sense of their authors and on no account in a crystalline way, e. according to their actual nonsense, in order to arrive at true faith and to admire the harmony of the critical household. Engels and Marx, therefore, know only the criticism of the literatur Zeitung Bruno Bauer, characteristic Ludwig Feuerbachs. A deliberate lie, proving how fluidly our saint has read a book in which his latest works are depicted merely as the culmination of all the work he has done but the church father lacked the calm to read in a crystalline way, for he fears his opponents as rivals who contest his canonization and want to deprive him of his sanctity, in order to make themselves sanctified. Let us, incidentally, note the fact that, according to St. Bruno's present statement, his literature Zeitung by no means aimed at founding social society or at representing, as it were, the last tear of grief shed by German ideology, nor did it aim at putting mind in the sharpest opposition to the mass and developing critical criticism in all its purity, but only at depicting the liberalism and radicalism of 1842 and their echoes in their half-heartedness and phrase-mongering, hence at combating the echoes of what has long disappeared. Tant de brute pour un omelette. Much ado about an omelette. An exclamation which Jacques Vallée, Sieur de Barros, is supposed to have made when a thunderstorm occurred while he was eating an omelette on a fast day incidentally, it is just here that the conception of history peculiar to German theory is again shown in its purest light. The year 1842 is held to be the period of the greatest brilliance of German liberalism, because at that time philosophy took part in politics. Liberalism vanishes for the critic with the cessation of the Deutsche Jahrbücher and the Renaissance, the organs of liberal and radical theory. After that, apparently, there remain only the echoes whereas in actual fact only now, when the German bourgeoisie feels a real need for political power, a need produced by economic relations, 
and is striving to satisfy has liberalism in Germany an actual existence and thereby won the chance of some success. Saint Bruno's profound distress over Die Heilige family did not allow him to criticize this work out of himself, through himself and with himself. To be able to master his pain he had first to obtain the work in a fluid form. He found this fluid form in a confused review, teeming with misunderstandings, in the Westphalisk Damp Boot, May issue, pages 206-14 All his quotations are taken from passages quoted in the Westphalisk Damp Boot and he quotes nothing that is not quoted there. The language of the saintly critic is likewise determined by the language of the Westphalian critic. In the first place, all the statements from the foreword which are quoted by the Westphalian, Damp Boot, p. 206, are transferred to the Wigensk via Telgers's Crypt, pages 140, 141. This transference forms the chief part of Bauer's criticism, according to the old principle already recommended by Hegel. To trust common sense and, moreover, in order to keep up with the times and advance with philosophy, to read reviews of philosophical works, perhaps even their prefaces and introductory paragraphs, for the latter give the general principles on which everything turns, while the former give, along with the historical information, also an appraisal which, because it is an appraisal, even goes beyond that which is appraised this beaten track can be followed in one's dressing gown, but the elevated feeling of the eternal, the sacred, the infinite, pursues its path in the vestments of a high priest, a path which, as we have seen, Saint Bruno also knows how to pursue while striking down, Hegel, Phenomenology, p. 54. The Westphalian critic, after giving a few quotations from the preface, continues. Thus the preface itself leads to the battlefield of the book, etc., p. 206. The saintly critic, having transferred these quotations into the Wigensk via Telgers's crypt, makes a more subtle distinction and says. Such is the terrain and the enemy which Engels and Marx have created for battle. From the discussion of the critical proposition, the worker creates nothing, the Westphalian critic gives only the summarizing conclusion. The saintly critic actually believes that this is all that was said about the proposition, copies out the Westphalian quotation on page 141 and rejoices at the discovery that only assertions have been put forward in opposition to criticism. Of the examination of the critical outpourings about love, the Westphalian critic on page 209 first writes out the corpus delicti in part and then a few disconnected sentences from the refutation, which he desires to use as an authority for his nebulous, sickly sweet sentimentality. On pages 141 to 42 the saintly critic copies him out word for word, sentence by sentence, in the same order as his predecessor quotes. The Westphalian critic exclaims over the corpse of Herr Julius Faucher, such is the fate of the beautiful on earth. Schiller. Wallenstein's Todd, Act 4, Scene 12. The saintly critic cannot finish his hard work without appropriating this exclamation to use irrelevantly on page 142. The Westphalian critic on page 212 gives a would-be summary of the arguments which are aimed against Saint Bruno himself in Die Heilige family. The saintly critic cheerfully and literally copies out all this stuff together with all the Westphalian exclamations. He has not the slightest idea that nowhere in the whole of this polemic discourse does anyone reproach him for transforming the problem of political emancipation into that of human emancipation, for wanting to kill the Jews, for transforming the Jews into theologians, for transforming Hegel into Herr Hinrichs, etc. Credulously, the saintly critic repeats the Westphalian critic's allegation that in Die Heilige family Marx volunteers to provide some sort of little scholastic treatise in reply to Bauer's silly self-apotheosis. Yet the words silly self-apotheosis, which Saint Bruno gives as a quotation, are nowhere to be found in the whole of Die Heilige family, but they do occur with the Westphalian critic. Nor is the little treatise offered as a reply to the self-apology of criticism on pages 150-63 of Die Heilige Family, but only in the following section on page 165, in connection with the world historic question, why did Herr Bauer have to engage in politics? 
Finally on page 143 St. Bruno presents Marx as an amusing comedian, here again following his Westphalian model, who resolved the world historic drama of critical criticism, on page 213, into a most amusing comedy. Thus one sees how the opponents of critical criticism dare and can know how the critic has worked, and still works. For obituary for M. Hess. What Engels and Marx could not yet do, M. Hess has accomplished. Such is the great, divine transition which owing to the relative can and cannot be done of the evangelists has taken so firm a hold of the holy man's fingers that it has to find a place, relevantly or irrelevantly, in every article of the church father. What Engels and Marx could not yet do, M. Hess has accomplished. But what is this what that Engels and Marx could not yet do? Nothing more nor less, indeed, than to criticize Stirner. And why was it that Engels and Marx could not yet criticize Stirner? For the sufficient reason that Stirner's book had not yet appeared when they wrote Die Heilige Family. This speculative trick of joining together everything and bringing the most diverse things into an apparent causal relation has truly taken possession not only of the head of our saint but also of his fingers. With him it has become devoid of any contents and degenerates into a burlesque manner of uttering tautologies with an important mean. For example, already in the Algemeine Literatur Zeitung, 1, 5, we read. The difference between my work and the pages which, for example, a Philip Sun covers with writing, that is, the empty pages on which, for example, a Philip Sun writes, must, therefore, be so constituted as in fact it is. Bauer, Neues Schrift and Über die Judenfridge. M. Hess, for whose writings Engels and Marx take absolutely no responsibility, seems such a strange phenomenon to the saintly critic that he is only capable of copying long excerpts from Die Letzten Philosophen and passing the judgment that on some points this criticism has not understood Feuerbach or also, O Theology. The vessel wishes to rebel against the potter. Cf. Epistle to the Romans, 9, 20-21. Having once more performed the hard work of quoting, our saintly critic finally arrives at the conclusion that Hess copies from Hegel, since he uses the two words united and development. Saint Bruno, of course, had in a roundabout way to try to turn against Feuerbach the proof given in Die Heilige family of his own complete dependence on Hegel. See, that is how Bauer had to end. He fought as best he could against all the Hegelian categories, with the exception of self-consciousness particularly in the glorious struggle of the literatur Zeitung against Herr Hinrichs. How he fought and conquered them we have already seen. For good measure, let us quote Wigand, page 110, where he asserts that The true, one, solution, two, of contradictions, three, in nature and history, four, the true unity, five, of separate relations, six, the genuine, seven, basis, eight, and abyss, nine, of religion, the truly infinite, 10, irresistible, self-creative, 11, personality, 12, has not yet been found. These three lines contain not two doubtful Hegelian categories, as in the case of Hess, but a round dozen of true, infinite, irresistible Hegelian categories which reveal themselves as such by, the true unity of separate relations C, that is how Bauer had to end. And if the holy man thinks that in Hess he has discovered a Christian believer, not because Hess hopes as Bruno says but because he does not hope and because he talks of the resurrection, then our great church father enables us, on the basis of this same page 110, to demonstrate his very pronounced Judaism. He declares there. That the true, living man in the flesh has not yet been born. A new elucidation about the determination of the unique sex, and the mongrel produced, Bruno Bauer is not yet a le to master all dogmatic formulas, etc. That is to say, the Messiah is not yet born, the Son of Man has first to come into the world and this world, being the world of the Old Testament, is still under the rod of the law, of dogmatic formulas. Just as Saint Bruno, as shown above, made use of Engels and Marx for a transition to Hess, so now the latter serves him to bring Feuerbach finally into causal connection with his excursions on Stirner, 
die Heilich family and die Letzten Philosophin. See, that is how Feuerbach had to end. Philosophy had to end piously, etc., Wigand, p. 145. The true causal connection, however, is that this exclamation is an imitation of a passage from Hess die Letzten Philosophin aimed against Bauer, among others, preface, p. 4. Thus, and in no other way had the last offspring of the Christian ascetics to take farewell of the world. Saint Bruno ends his speech for the prosecution against Feuerbach and his alleged accomplices with the reproach to Feuerbach that all he can do is to trumpet, to blow blasts on a trumpet, whereas Monsieur B. Bauer or Madame La Critique, the mongrel produced, to say nothing of the continual destruction, drives forth in his triumphal chariot and gathers new triumphs, p. 125, hurls down from the throne, p. 119, slays, p. 111, strikes down like thunder, p. 115, destroys once. And for all, p. 120, shatters, p. 121, allows nature merely to vegetate, p. 120, builds stricter prisons, p. 104, and, finally, with crushing pulpit eloquence expatiates, on p. 105, in a brisk, pious, cheerful and free brisk, pious, cheerful and free, frisch, from, fruhlich und free, the initial words of a student saying, which were turned by Ludwig John into the motto of the sport movement he initiated fashion on the stably strongly firmly existing, hurling rock-like matter and rocks at Fuggerbach's head, p. 110, and, in conclusion, by a side thrust vanquishes St. Max. As well, by adding the most abstract abstractness and the hardest hardness, on p. 124, to critical criticism, social society and rock-like matter and rocks. All this St. Bruno accomplished through himself, in himself and with himself, because he is he himself, indeed, he is himself always the greatest and can always be the greatest, is and can be. Through himself, in himself and with himself, p. 136. That's that. Saint Bruno would undoubtedly be dangerous to the female sex, for he is an irresistible personality, if in the same measure on the other hand he did not fear sensuousness as the barrier against which man has to deal himself a mortal blow. Therefore, through himself, in himself and with himself he will hardly pluck any flowers but rather allow them to wither in infinite longing and hysterical yearning for the irresistible personality, who possesses this unique sex and these unique, particular sex organs. The following passage is crossed out in the manuscript. 5. Saint Bruno in his triumphal chariot Before leaving our church father victorious and confident of victory, let us for a moment mingle with the gaping crowd that comes up running just as eagerly when he drives forth in his triumphal chariot and gathers new triumphs as when General Tom Thumb with his four ponies provides a diversion. It is not surprising that we hear the humming of street songs, for to be welcomed with street songs belongs after all to the concept of triumph in general.